Simon Warwick, thank you very much. <laughs> so before I start, quick word of warning. Uh, I'm a geneticist, so I'm a scientist by training, uh, and I happen to like graphs. So this is a quick graph. Uh, the level of audience pain, that's you, against the number of slides given in a 50-minute presentation. Now, I reckon there's a safe limit of about 90. Uh, being a scientist, I like to experiment, so apologies for this. Uh, we'll be using no less than 208. <laughs> now, now, before you all leg it out F-bombing, uh, going, you know, what the fiddlesticks is happening here, I thought I'd start off by showing you where I'm going with a map. So here's a map. <laughs> and we're going to start off with strategy, and then the rest of the presentation will head rapidly south. Uh, we're going to go into situational awareness, the importance of maps and why you should map. Then we'll talk about patterns. And if we've got time at the end, we're going to go on a little bit of a magical mystery tour. So I, I suppose I better start with strategy. Now, for me, this is a personal story. Started in 1995 when I was in the Arts Hotel in Barcelona. Um, I was working for a big company, and I was with the SVP, Senior Vice President, and they gave me the strategy for the company. And I had a look at it, and they said, well, what do you think? And I, I read through it, and it had words like innovation and culture and efficiency. And I said, well, it looks good. I hadn't got a clue, not, 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 not a clue at all. But the problem was, 10 years later, I was the CEO of this company, a company called Fatango. We had about 16 different lines of business. We had lots of strategy documents, but I still didn't have a clue about what a good strategy was. So I handed the strategy document uh, to somebody who worked for me and asked them, what do you think about this? And they leafed through the pages and said, it looks good to me. So <laughs> a rather depressing moment in my life. Um, anyway, this company had a problem. Uh, the problem wasn't revenue, because we had loads of revenue, and wasn't profitability. It was all growing. The problem was me. I was the fat cat in charge, and literally, I had, hadn't got a clue what I was doing. I was the fake CEO, okay? I wasn't the chess-playing master that you read about in HBR. I was the, the alchemist. I was making it up as I went along. Now, it didn't mean we didn't have vision statements. We had those. Uh, this is our vision statement in 2003. Uh, our strategy is customer-focused. We will lead an innovative effort of the market through our use of agile techniques and open source. But the problem with it was I had nicked it from other companies. <laughs> so I started going around recording CEOs talking about strategy. I would listen to the words they would use and record, you know, the commonly repeated terms. I gave them a name. I called them business-level abstractions of a healthy strategy, or BLAS for short. I do this every couple of years. This was 2014. Here are the common BLAS. Uh, digital business, big data, disruptive, innovative, collaborative, competitive advantage, ecosystem, open source, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If I did it today, you'd probably, I don't know, IoT, AI, VR, blockchain. You've got to have a bit of blockchain in there. <laughs> Anyway, so I combined multiple companies' strategy documents together and came up with a generic blah template. <laughs> our strategy is blah, we will lead a blah effort of the market through our use of blah and blah to build a blah. And then I would combine the blahs and blah template, just smash them together, and auto-generate 64 random gibberish strategies. <laughs> Things like this. Our uh, strategy number one, uh, our strategy is customer focus. We will lead a disruptive effort of the market through our use of innovative social media and big data to build a collaborative cloud-based ecosystem, blah, blah, blah. Number two, our strategy is innovative digital business. We will lead a growth effort of the market through our use of customer focus, competitive advantage. I can barely say the words. Don't worry, I'm not going through all 64, but... I would send them around to people, 
And I, last time, I got 400 responses of three basic types. The first type was this. This is the exact wording from our business plan. <laughs> the second type was, I've seen two of these used already. And my third and favorite was, are you for hire? So a friend of mine's put this all online, by the way. Uh, this is strategy as a service. So if you ever need a strategy, just type in the URL, and it will make, magically create you one out of nothing whatsoever. Uh, and if you don't like it, it's really simple. You just press refresh. <laughs> so I went back uh, to, to, to first principles, because I was starting to suspect I might not be the only person making it up. So I went back to Sun Tzu. Anybody know what Sun Tzu wrote? Art of War, right. So Sun Tzu talked about five factors that mattered in competition. One, understand your purpose, your moral imperative. Two, understand the landscape, the environment you are competing in. Three, understand, oh, sorry, three, understand climatic patterns. So these are, you know, how that landscape is changing. Four, understand doctrine, so that's universally useful principles of organization. And, and lastly, you get to the leadership bit, which is all about understanding where to attack and how to change uh, the environment. And then I came across uh, John Boyd, US Air Force. Anybody heard of John Boyd? Yeah, fantastic. Anybody know what he did? Uda, fantastic, Uda loops. So you have the game, your purpose. The next thing you need to do is observe the environment. That's what landscape and climatic patterns are about. Then you orientate around it. That's what principles and doctrine are all about. And then you have to decide where I'm going to attack, and then you act. And it's a cycle which you keep on going around. Now, I was quite excited by this. So, so I showed other CEOs this, and they all responded, yeah, it doesn't matter. It's all about the importance of why. Well, it turns out there's two whys. There's the why of purpose, as in I want to win the game, I want to do something. And there's the why of movement, as should I move here or there. And these are two totally different whys. So if you think of a game of chess, the why of purpose might be to win the game. The why of movement is should I move this piece or that piece? And if you move the pawn, you'll gain some sort of positional advantage. And of course, if you move the queen, it's, it's checkmate. Now, it's through movement that we actually learn. So Liz, earlier on, at the very start of the conference, talked about the importance of action. It, it's movement enables us to learn about an environment. So I went back to my online photo business. It, it was relatively small, you know, several million users, but this was 2004, 2005. And we had a purpose of sorts. It wasn't a great one because we had 16 different lines of business. And yes, we were being profitable and revenue was growing. So I asked, how did we understand the landscape? Now, that brings me to my second topic, which is situational awareness. Now, anybody got a military background here? Just shout out yes. How important is situational awareness in the military? Very. Right. Super. Uh, for the rest of you, I'm going to explain it with three stories, Vikings, chess, and uh, Themistocles. So Vikings, uh, very frightening people. This is how they used to navigate. From Hermann, head you west towards Half, and you will have sailed north of Hatland. They used to use stories. So you'd spend 10 years learning your epic story before you were put in charge of a boat. Now that means that. Quick question to all of you. What would you use to navigate? A visual map or a verbal story? Map? Yeah? Map, map. OK, what do we use in business? Stories, right, super. We'll come back to that. The second one is chess world. I want you to imagine you live in a world where everybody plays chess. And how well you play the game determines your ranking in this world. But no one's ever seen a chessboard. All you've seen are these characters on a screen. And you play the game very simply. You press a button, pawn. Uh, your opponent counters, pawn. Uh, you press a button, pawn. They counter, queen. 
And the game goes on for ages and ages until somebody wins or more likely it's a draw. Now what will happen is we will take these sequences and stick them into our big data systems and come up with magic secrets of success. So if you press king, I should respond with knight and rook. If you don't believe me, this is Harvard Business Review, November 2011, how earlobes can signify leadership potential. It's the phrenology of management. It is unfortunately not an April Fool. Now, one day, you're going to play a game against someone who will see something truly magical. They will see the board. You've been playing for 20 years. You've got all the books, you know, the secrets of the rook, and uh, you've got all your big data systems, and they've been playing for about a week. You're going to move. They're going to counter. You're going to move. They're going to counter, and you're going to have lost. And the first thing you're going to do is, you know, I'll quickly scribble down that sequence after saying, you know, what the fiddlesticks happened there. You're going to record that sequence, and you're going to try and play it against them. What's going to happen? You're going to lose. All right, so now you'll start recording other things. You, you can't see that there's a board, so you're starting, starting to record how quickly they press the button. How's that going to help you? Not. So now you'll start saying, well, maybe it's cultural. Maybe they're a happy sort of person. Right, you lose because you exist in a low-level situational awareness environment, and they exist in a high. So what would you use to learn? Secrets of success or context-specific play as described by a map or a board? Yeah? Right, what do we use in business? Secrets of success, okay. Right, so the third one, and the last one is Themistocles, uh, uh, ancient politician, Greek general, had a problem, the Persians were invading. Now what he decided to do was to block off the Straits of Artemisium, force the Persians along a coastal road into a narrow pass called Thermopylae. Now there were about 170,000 Persians, about 4,000 Greeks, including 300 Spartans, fantastic. Right, I want you to imagine you're part of the Athenian army, so you're part of the Greek city-states. It's the eve of battle. Themistocles is standing there giving you purpose and moral imperative. We've got to defend against the invading Persian hordes. But then he says to you, I don't actually understand the landscape. I, I don't understand the environment. I have no map, but I have no fear for I have created a SWOT diagram. <laughs> so, strengths. A well-trained Spartan army, a high level of motivation uh, uh, not to become a Persian slave. Uh, weaknesses, the ephors might stop the Spartans turning up. A truckload of Persians are turning up. Opportunities, get rid of the Persians, get rid of the Spartans. We're Athenian, we actually hate the Spartans, and threats the Persians get rid of us, and the oracle says a really dodgy film might be produced a few thousand years later. So quick question, what would you use to communicate and determine strategy in battle? Position and movement, described by a map, or would you use a magic framework like a SWOT diagram? <laughs> map? Okay, you know what's coming. <laughs> what do we use in business? It's magic framework. So let me go back to chess versus alchemy. If I look at navigation, learning, and strategy, then chess, it's all visual. It's context specific. It's all about position and movement. It's what we call a high level situational awareness environment. Okay, it's a bit like the military. If you ask a general, uh, why did you bomb that hill? A general won't say, because I read an article in General Weekly that bombing hills is the new thing. <laughs> They're not going to say to you, because you know, I've got this consultant report that 67% of other generals are bombing hills. And they're not going to say to you, because I thought it would make a good story. It's all about position and movement. 
Now, alchemy, on the other hand, is all about storytelling, secrets of success, and magic frameworks. It's what we call a low-level situational awareness environment. And that's where I was back in 2004 as this fake CEO. So I would show this to my friends, and they would go, but we're all successful, getting slightly angry at this point. But, but I was successful. Our revenue was growing, but the business is a cat fight. And it's okay if you cannot see the environment as long as everybody else is in the same boat. If we're all hopeless, it doesn't matter. Now, there's a wonderful study, not a very popular study, uh, by a chap called Marcus Fitzer. Uh, he, he looked at the use of variance decomposition into uh, CEO effects. And, and basically, what it determined was the CEO impact was, was random chance, i.e., you could just replace them with anyone off the street, <laughs> which is probably why it's not very popular. OK, so at this point, people get really angry at me, saying, we're not stupid. Well, I'm not saying people are. I'm saying, understand the difference. We can't see the environment in which we're operating in. And so this is why I'm going to talk about maps. So what do we mean by a map? Well, it turns out that maps have very specific characteristics. One, they're visual. Two. They're context-specific. This is a battle of Thermopylae. It's not the Battle of Waterloo. Three, you have the position of pieces on the map relative to some form of anchor. In this case, the anchor is the compass. So this is north, south, east, or west of that. In a, in a chessboard, it's a, basically it's a uh, coordinate system. So position A1, A2, et cetera. You also have components and consistency of movement. So if I want to go from Athens to Thebes, which direction would I go? Northwest? Yeah. You'd expect to go the same way every time. You'd be surprised if you headed that direction and suddenly discovered that, you know, Thebes was to the south. Okay. So people then tell me, but we have maps, and that's what I thought. I had things like this, a systems map. Have you ever seen one of these IT diagrams, box and wires? Yes? OK, so I'm going to take one of the boxes, CRM, Customer Relationship Management, and I'm going to move it from there to there. How does that change the, the map? It hasn't. Now, if I take a geographical map and I shift Australia and put it next to, say, Germany, how does that change the map? Well, the problem is this is not a map. Lacks those basic characteristics. But it's OK. I had things like this, business process maps. Have you, have you seen one of those? Yes. Excellent. They're not maps either. <laughs> but that was all right. I, you know, people now have these sorts of things, digital road maps. Have you seen one of these? Yeah. You know, if you want to go from social TV to say, which is up there somewhere, uh, you have to go through social apps, review advocacy marks. It's just gibberish, and it's also not a map. <laughs> you seen one of these? Have a guess. No. I'm afraid we keep using that term, <laughs> and it doesn't mean what we think it means. So I thought, OK, I've got to somehow create a map of business. But how do I do that? So I had a cup of tea. And while I was having a cup of tea, I thought, I, as a user, I have a need for a cup of tea. But a cup of tea has needs. It needs tea. It needs hot water. It also needs a mug. Now, hot water has needs. It needs kettle. It needs cold water. And a kettle has needs. It needs power. So what I can do is I can see the anchor at the top, which is my user. I may have many. I may have public consumers or regulators or the business itself. And what I've now got is position described by a value chain or a chain of needs. So I took my systems diagram, thought, right, what does the user actually need? Not what they want, but what do they need? And that's the anchor at the top. And now I can describe the position of components. So online photo storage required a website, required platform, et cetera. The problem is, on its own, this is useless because it doesn't have movement. 
It's not a map yet. So I looked at one thing, power, looked at the history of power. I know we started off with things like the Parthian battery, 400 AD. We got systems like the Hippolyte Pixie. Uh, then we got generators, Siemens generators. Eventually, we ended up with uh, utility provision, Tesla and Westinghouse. So I started looking into how things evolved. Because evolution is change equals movement. And this is the pattern that came out. If I look at the ubiquity of something versus certainty, and this was published oh, about 10, a decade ago, actually. If you look at ubiquity and certainty, you start off with the genesis of novel and new acts, rare and poorly understood. You get custom-built examples. Then you get products and rental services. Finally, commodity and utility services. And it's all driven by demand and supply competition. And it turns out it's not just activities, but practices, data, even knowledge evolve through the same path. So what I can do is I can take my value chain, I can put that evolution axis, flatten it at the bottom, Genesis custom product commodity, and move things into the right position, and now I've got a map. The top is the anchor, I've got the position of pieces in a chain of needs, and I have got movement and consistency of movement. And that was 2005, and I was quite excited. So I showed other people and they went, so what? <laughs> well, it's a bit like playing chess. If you can see the landscape, you can just watch people playing the game and start to learn patterns. And that's what we're going to get onto now. So the first patterns that you discover are climactic patterns. And there's 31 of these, and I'm, we're going to go through a couple, no more. So climactic patterns are the rules that change the game. So you don't get a choice over these. These will happen whether you like it or not. So the first one is everything evolves. If there's supply and demand competition, everything in your map is moving from left to right. The second one is that characteristics change. It doesn't matter whether we're talking about money, computing, or penicillin. It starts off in this uncharted space where it's chaotic, uncertain. It's a differential. It's constantly changing. And over time, it becomes industrialized, ordered, standard, stable, dull, boring. Now, for me, this was quite a big thing. Because in 2000, we'd gone all XP as in extreme programming. Have you heard of extreme programming? Yes? Right. And by about 2002, 2003, we discovered it didn't work everywhere. And the reality is that agile, as in extreme programming, test-driven development, um, clients working with the development very closely, is very strong in that uncharted space because you want to reduce the cost of change, because change is the norm. But it's very weak in the more industrialized space compared to things like Six Sigma. And both of them are weak in the middle compared to more lean, agile type approaches. So you're using Scrum, MVP, Kanban, you've got product owners, and so forth. So what you learn is there's no such thing as one size fits all. The next pattern you learn is as things evolve, they become more efficient, but they also enable the appearance of higher order systems. So electricity-enabled computing, radio, television. It expands what we call the adjacent possible, increases the speed at which we can do this stuff. And that's componentization from Herbert Simon's theory of hierarchy. Now, the rate of evolution of a system is dependent upon the organization of its subsystems. The next pattern you learn is those higher-order systems create new sources of value and worth. Now, they're uncharted. So you have to gamble. They're highly uncertain. So when things like TV appears, at the same time, you've got the refrigeration blanket. Now, if you'd asked me what would make more money, a box with pictures or a blanket which keeps you cool at night, I would have said, the blanket, obviously. Uh, turns out it was the other way. Now, as things evolve, like electricity enables computing and that evolves, it enables other things to appear, so SDC and then databases, then intelligent agents. So what you've got is a chain which is constantly moving from left to right, enabling higher order systems to appear. So it's expanding upwards. The next pattern you learn is the Red Queen. You don't have choice over evolution. If you are competing against others, and one use more evolved systems, so they have benefits of efficiency, speed, and access to new sources of worth, they create pressure 
on everybody else to adapt. As more evolve, that pressure mounts and then mounts. So you don't get a choice over this, which is why we don't have companies run by gas lamps using abacuses. The next pattern you discover is that we have inertia, particularly from past success. So Blockbuster Netflix. Who was first with a website? Blockbuster, great, right. Who was first with video ordering online? Blockbuster, good. Who was first with experimenting with video streaming? Blockbuster, yay. Who went bankrupt first? Blockbuster. Blockbuster pretty much out innovated the market. What took them down? No. Where was the inertia? Yes, <laughs> the inertia was at Blockbuster. Yes, but what was the source? Late fees, perfect, fantastic. Do you remember late fees? You get, you get a video cassette, take it home, forget to bring it back the next day. Ka-ching, that's what their business model was built around. And of course, what happened is video streaming got rid of late fees. That's where the inertia came from. So the point about this is once you know these patterns, you can start to anticipate change. You start uh, off with a map, as we did in 2005. We know that platform and compute is going to go to a utility. We know that we're going to have inertia to this change. We know it's going to enable higher order systems to appear. And the point about this, it tells me multiple points that I could attack. Do I want to build the world's first ever platform as a service or computer as a service? Or do I wait and build something useful on top in this uncharted and unexplored space? Or do I want to attempt to differentiate around our current product offering? The next thing you get onto is doctrine. So these are basically universally applicable principles regardless of context. So climactic patterns will happen to you whether you like it or not. There's about 40 different forms of doctrine, uh, basic principles which are universally useful. So you could choose to do them, but they are pretty useful in all cases. There's a whole bunch of patterns which are very context specific as well. So Daniel talked about the importance of principles. Uh, the first one, is when you are looking at a big complex system, uh, like the emergency services mobile communication platform, and you've got a 300 page specification, the first question you need to ask is what is the user need? Now, one of the things about maps, because they turn that into a, a map, because no one could actually answer that question, is the anchor is the user need. So in this case, the user requires emergency function point to point, point to multiple points. So your first piece of doctrine, is all about focus on user needs. The second one is thinking small, as in knowing the details. The third one is that if you have many maps, you can share and collaborate with them. So you take maps from borders, immigration, and police, and what we discover is we've got duplication in the maps, i.e. we're building the same thing at multiple different points. But worse than that, we also have bias. So user registration, we're building six times. Five thinks it's a commodity, or something which everybody does. One thinks it's something sort of magical and new, and they're the only companies who've ever done user registration. Now, in government, the worst example of duplication I have is 118 workflow systems doing the same thing registering prisoners into prisons. This is nothing compared to the private sector. When it comes to efficiency, inefficiency and waste, the private sector is supreme. So I've got a global pharma company which has 350 enterprise content management systems, 350 teams building enterprise content management. They had a group of their global architects and once this became clear, one of them said, don't worry, we're building the global enterprise content management system. <laughs> the good news was about two seconds later, one of the other architects went, that's what we're doing. 
five global efforts to build the global enterprise content management system in an environment with 350 enterprise content management systems. The best of the lot, though, other than the global defense company with 2,000 accounting systems, is banking. I've got a bank which has 1,000 risk management systems. Complains it can't innovate. I wonder why. So you take your map, you start removing duplication. Then you start applying principles like FIST, fast and expensive, simple and tiny. US Air Force, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Dan Ward. They used it to build the Harvest Hawk, which went from paper to combat operations in 18 months, fired its first shot in 19 months. If you know anything about military hardware, that is fast. Now the principle is very simple. You break things down into small components like this. Break contracts down, treat them quickly, individually, uh, inexpensively. Now, when we looked at the contract structure, it looked more like this. And that's a problem. Why is it a problem? Well, do you remember I said no one size fits all? Climactic patterns. So when you have a map, the stuff on the left-hand side, you build in-house with agile techniques. The stuff in the middle, you use off-the-shelf products, or probably, uh, if you're building yourself, you use something like lean. Stuff on the right-hand side, you outsource, or uh, you, if you're building yourself, you're using something along the lines of Six Sigma. So you're applying multiple methods at the same time. There is no one-size-fits-all method which covers a broad contract structure. So to explain the problem, is anybody here from finance? No? Okay. Right. Do you know what a world perception survey is? No? Right. World perception is part of a self-driving car. I'm going to pretend you're all from finance, which means everything in IT is elvish to you. And I'm going to take the systems diagram for a self-driving car, and I'm going to convert it to elvish. Now I'm going to ask you a question. Should we outsource or build our own, A? Should we outsource or build our own, B? What do you think? We, we do this all the time, by the way. Any ideas? No? OK, I'm going to turn it into a, it's exactly the same diagram, still in Elvish, but in mapping form. Should we outsource or build our own, A? Outsource. Should we outsource or build our own B? Build our own. So I convert it back into English, and there you are. GPS on this side. Fortunately, you didn't decide to go and build your own GPS system. And, and well, perception server on, on, on the left. Now, most organizations, of course, have no maps, which means they, what you typically do is yo-yo uh, between methodologies. Uh, somebody, they all do Six Sigma, somebody comes along, does a bit of Agile, works really well over there, let's do Agile everywhere. Uh, and then somebody comes along, oh, Six Sigma worked really well over there, let's do Six Sigma everywhere. Or, or, or they do the outsource everything. Have there been, anybody ever worked in an organization like that? Yeah. Yes. Good. Right. So you outsource everything. Uh, and what happens is the industrialized parts get efficiently treated, uh, but you get hammered. Uh, with excessive change control cost in the, that uncharted space. I mean, you can't see the map. You don't realize it's happening. Um, and you get hammered because it's going to change. So you can't actually specify the stuff. Now, what you should do is map it and break it down into components. But invariably, what happens is somebody says, oh, well, next time we need to specify it better. It doesn't ever get better, I'm afraid. All right, so once you're using appropriate methods, now you think about small teams. So things like Amazon two pizza rule, higher cell-based structures. Then you start to discover that engineering on the left-hand side and finance on the left-hand side and design on the left-hand side are not the same as finance and, say, engineering on the right. So you start to realize you need to have multiple attitudes. Uh, there are some people very good in the pioneering space, so they build wonderful things which fail a lot. And there are some people who are good at taking these sort of wonderful things and actually making it useful for other people. I mean, they're, they're brilliant at that. And then you get some people who are brilliant at taking this stuff and industrializing it and making the empires of scale. So what you can do is you start to design organizations for constant evolution. Pioneers pioneer, the settlers steal. 
from the pioneers. It's never the pioneers handed over. Pioneers have to build and operate and run their stuff. The settlers steal, forcing the pioneers to move on. The settlers either throw it away because it's like kitten internet and therefore useless, or they turn it into something useful, and then the town planners steal from them. And that way you create a cycle within an organization which copes with constant change. Now that was um, those set of basic principles, uh, focus on user need, uh, remove duplication, thinking about attitude and attitude, uh, using small contracts, breaking down things into small components, designing for constant evolution, was leading edge organizational thinking in 2005. So that's 12 years ago. If you want to know more about this sort of subject, there's a wonderful document open source by GCHQ, that's our intelligence services, called Boiling Frogs, where you can discover more about this stuff. So, you've got a purpose. You're starting to understand the landscape. By learning about the landscape, you're starting to learn about patterns which you can use for anticipation. You're now starting to learn about principles and doctrine and starting to organize yourself a around the environment, now we finally get into the bit that is strategy. This is all about context-specific forms of gameplay. So there's about 70 of these. This is flanking versus firing. So flanking is context-specific. You only flank an opponent when they're actually at a place. There's no point flanking them if they're not there. Whereas firing is universally useful. As in, if you're going to do suppressive fire, it's a good idea that your soldiers know how to shoot a gun, and you don't have to go, can you go off, train up for six months, come back, and then we can do some suppressive fire, because your opponents are likely to have moved by that point. So you take your map, so this was us in 2005, online photo service, uh, we know things are going to evolve. We know we're going to have inertia. This gives us multiple points of attack. The question is, how can we now manipulate this environment to our favor? And there's loads of ways of doing this. Uh, open approaches are great for accelerating things to an industrialized space. You can slow things down if there's inertia with fear, uncertainty, and doubt. You can use constraints against others. Uh, there's all sorts of different mechanisms for manipulating the landscape. Once you learn those and you play the scenario, you come up with a context-specific form of gameplay, which is what we did. So we, we knew Platform was going to go to a, a utility, so we built the world's first ever serverless environment in Old Street in London. This was in 2005. You built entire applications in JavaScript front and back end. You didn't have to worry about the infrastructure or anything along those lines. We'd anticipated somebody was going to do a compute utility play. I thought it was going to be Google. It turned out to be Amazon the next year. We know a specific pattern in the ecosystem model known as ILC, which basically is very simple. You commoditize stuff, you enable others to build on top of you, and then you mine the metadata to find new future patterns, which you then commoditize. And, and so that was our play. We also used an open approach to, uh, to, to, to spread the system. So the next thing is you act, because you, you learn through acting and you iterate around the cycle, getting better and better as you go. So we launched uh, 2006, we launched Zimki, uh, the world's first ever uh, serverless environment. Uh, we, it was called Fra Framework as a service back then, with things like functional billing and all that sort of capability, and it grew like hotcakes. It was fantastic. Unfortunately for me, at that time, I wasn't mapping out political capital. So uh, the parent company had a big American management consultancy firm come in and explain that the three things that we were doing in 2005, 2006, which was cloud, 3D printing, and the use of mobile phones as cameras were not the future. <laughs> the future was, in fact, 3D television. So we shut it all down, spent a billion on 3D TV. Anybody own a 3D TV? Oh, there's one. Wow. Do you use it, though? No. Right. OK. <laughs> OK, so, um, so I went to Ubuntu. Anybody heard of Ubuntu? 
Oh, fantastic. So in 2008, we mapped out Ubuntu, used the map to work out where to attack. We were about 2 to 3% of the operating system market. I spent about half a million. 18 months later, we're 70% of all cloud computing. Does anybody remember that, the days when it was like Microsoft Red Hat, Microsoft Red Hat, almost no mention of Ubuntu, and then about a year and a half later, it's Ubuntu everywhere? Yeah. Yes? Thank you. <laughs> so then I wrote something called, uh, with several others, Liam Maxwell and others, something called the Better for Less paper, uh, which was for the coalition government. Um, uh, prior to them getting in, into power, uh, this was for Francis Maud. Uh, it helped uh, lead, create things called spend control and also helped in the creation of GDS. Uh, this is Liam, uh, who heavily uses mapping. Uh, this is one of his recent services they're tweeting about. They reckon they've saved another 425 million, uh, 1.5 billion in its lifetime, uh, simply by mapping the environment. I mean, myself, these days, most of the stuff I do is nation-state level competition. So China versus uh, uh, USA. This is actually the space of a uh, self-driving car. Anyway, normally at this point, people go to me, oh, this is really complex. Well, actually, if you think about, um, we go back to this one where I talked about, would you use positional movement or would you use a SWOT? We all laughed because we would use a map in combat. But in business, we're not used to it. What we're f familiar with are magic frameworks, which is why we use it. It's like Vikings. Vikings were not daft to use stories rather than maps. They were unfamiliar with the concept of mapping itself. So summary, very simple, strategy is a cycle. Um, Understand your purpose, understand the landscape, you start learning about climatic patterns, you can start to anticipate change, you start organizing and structuring yourself around this with principles and doctrine, and then you eventually get into gameplay once you can identify where to attack and how to manipulate the market. There are about 31 common climatic patterns, about 40 different forms of doctrine, about 70 different forms of gameplay. So it's quite a complex game of chess, but it's one that can be learnt and one that is expanding. Now, the key thing in this process is to act. You learn through movement. Of course, it helps to understand the landscape. If you can't see the landscape, you can't learn climactic pans. It's not easy to learn doctrine other than sticking your finger up in the air and guessing. It becomes very difficult to learn context-specific play. Now, the cycle itself is iterative. So the more you play, it's like chess. And the more you play the game, the better you get at it. And this is all summarized uh, by uh, the statement from Deng Xiaoping, crossing the river by feeling the stone. So you have purpose, you have a direction, you need to understand the landscape, you need to take small steps, and you need to adapt along the path. And at that point, I'll say thank you very much and just point out this is all Creative Commons. Apparently, we've got some extra time. Throw this line. Aha! So we're going into the danger zone. Okay. <laughs> so there's a whole bunch of topics I can talk about. Um, the, so we're going into the magical mystery tour now, I'm afraid. Uh, we can talk about co-evolution of practice, competitor analysis, flow, ecosystems, falls may, evolution, weak signals. And if we finally get to the end, I can talk about that wonderful subject known as Brexit. Or you can ask questions. Who wants to know about co-evolution? Does anybody know, do you all know what DevOps is? Yeah? Really? Okay. When compute was a product, oops, sorry, we built applications using emerging architectural practices because um, practices evolve as well as activities based upon the idea of compute as a product. So uh, one of the characteristics of computers as a product was high MTTR, so high mean time to recovery. So when my server went bang, it would take me weeks to get a new one. So we built emerging architectural practices, things like um, capacity planning, scale up, bigger machines, uh, M plus one, uh, highly resilient machines, and disaster recovery tests. Do you remember that stuff? Yeah? 
Good. That evolved, and it basically became a best practice uh, for computers as a product. And, you know, we used to laugh at people. If you hadn't done your capacity planning, you know, uh, you'd run out of uh, a space on your email server or whatever it happened to be. And then what happened is compute evolved from product to utility. And we gave it a dreadful name. We called it cloud. And what we got is a, a new set of emerging architectural practices based upon its characteristics. So when your server went bang, it took you seconds to get a new one. Uh, so we started distributed systems. We started uh, distributing systems. We started design for failure, the use of chaos engines and chaos monkeys. There's a whole set of new practices, and including now we could do things like continuous deployment um, because we didn't have to wait weeks for new infrastructure. And so a new tribe developed around this, and over time, as that stuff evolved, we gave it a meme, a name. We called it DevOps. And so what we've got today is applications built with best architectural practice for a, a product world, and that we call legacy, and applications built with good evolving to best architectural practices for a utility world, and that, that we call DevOps. Now, this is a pattern known as coevolution. You often get coevolution of practice with activity. It's fairly basic. Now, what happens is people ran around writing articles, you know, forget earlobes now. It's how cloud can signify leadership potential. So a whole bunch of CEOs go, you know, make my legacy cloudy, to which people take the legacy and stick it on Amazon. Amazon has a, an outage, and they run around screaming, the end of cloud is nigh. To which you go, shouldn't that architecture evolve as well? And they go, burn him heretic, that sort of thing. So... Um, of course, you know, this is because they have inertia because of pre-existing practice uh, to that change. And that's why you get vendors coming in with, you know, what you need is an enterprise cloud. You know, all oh, I want an enterprise, all the benefits of volume operations using commodity components, but built with non-commodity hardware customized to my needs. I mean, aye, laddie, but you cannot change the laws of physics. Uh, commodity does not equal non-commodity. Volume operations does not equal customization. It was all pretty much gibberish, but didn't stop people spending billions on these sorts of efforts. Anyway, the same thing is now going on at the platform layer. So we're moving away from a product stack like lamp.net to much more of a utility stack. Uh, things like Lambda. Have you heard of Lambda? AWS Lambda? Fabulous. And what we're getting, we've given it a rubbish name because we're always good at rubbish names. Uh, we've called it serverless. And we're getting this uh, co-evolved practice. Now, we haven't got a meme for it yet. So people have just said, well, we'll call it Jeff until people come up with a sensible name. But it's a combination of finance and dev, and we're learning what those practices are. Anyway, they're evolving. And so, you know, that's where you should be investing, serverless and those practices, and you're getting a new tribe uh, that's forming. And what you have is inertia to this change, uh, created by legacy coding practices, legacy architecture, and even DevOps now, because it's down below the line. It doesn't matter so much. You're, you're getting uh, uh, resistance uh, from that space. Of course, if you turn up and say DevOps is the new legacy, they all, you know, burn him heretic. Um, but if you take it, it takes about five to seven years to get up and running with a DevOps practice. Uh, great to be doing in 2010, but we're now 2017. But by the time you, if you started now, by the time you get up and running, it would be the new legacy. Of course, people go, you know, DevOps goes young serverless, I will teach you so much. Uh, a bit like ITIL said to DevOps. And uh, uh, in this case, uh, the serverless crowd is saying, no thanks, you know, I'm, I'm learning from from ITIL or from some previous system. So um, that's co-evolution. Uh, unfortunately, tribe's got a tribe. So you, 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 you can try and stop it if you like, but it's just human nature. Uh, DevOps will be the, the new legacy. Um, competitor analysis? So do you want, I, I can stop whenever you wish, or I can keep on going, or you can ask questions, or, or there might be beer. Five more minutes, OK. <laughs> now, unfortunately, we have to get through all of those before I've got the stuff I can tell you all about the wonders of Brexit. Um, so I'll go as quick as I can. Competitor analysis. So you've got a cycle of change. 
and the strategy cycle, understand your purpose, landscape, observe the environment, etc. And uh, you, you can use this, you, you map out the landscape, you use climactic patterns, you're now trying to work out where to attack. In some cases, you're using a context-specific gameplay. I might be using constraints or open or using a bit of fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Um, but it's also useful to know what your state your competitors are in. So you can actually uh, um, use doctrine to sort of describe what an ideal organizational structure should look like and compare your competitors to that. So we've gone through several today. One is focus on user needs. Uh, one is think small, as in know the details. One is remove duplication. One is think small, as in contracts. One is use appropriate methods. Uh, number six is think, uh, think small, as in cell-based structures. Then think about aptitude and attitude and design for constant evolution. Um, but as I said, that's state of the art in 2005. And there are about 40 different forms of universally useful principles. So, you know, a lot more than I've actually shown you. Now, this, this table is actually quite useful because you can look at competitors and see how good they are at various of these bits. So this is a particular web giant. Uh, they're green across the board. Don't try and read the letters, just, just see the colors. Uh, they're green across the board. Uh, so, so they're actually pretty tough to compete against, and you could probably guess who they are. Uh, they've got a couple of weaknesses. Uh, this is an insurance company. Um, so green is good, amber is sort of like mm, weak, uh, red is warning. Uh, uh, they're, they're, they're not too bad. Uh, um, you wouldn't want them up against the, uh, the web player. Uh, this is a heavy engineering company. Uh, again, this is, this is uh, decidedly, well, more dodgy. Uh, wouldn't do very well against the insurance industry, but fortunately, you know, we try and regulate and protect our industries, uh, which is especially useful for the last one because this is a bank. So they're like red everywhere. So, you know, if the web giant ever comes into their space, it's curtains. I mean, they won't be able to adapt or anything along those lines. But the point about this is when you are looking at where to attack, along with using context-specific play, you can use uh, competitor uh, analysis as well. Look at their doctrine. Find where they're weak. Um, so Agile is an important part of this puzzle, by the way. It's not the whole thing. I mean, one of the doctrine is obviously to use appropriate methods. I know everybody runs around saying, you've got to be agile at everything. It's very good at certain spaces, but um, you know, the doctrine has actually turned out to be use appropriate methods. So flow, right, cup of tea. I, I did a... Um, chain, a value chain for a cup of tea. Uh, one of the beauties about these uh, chains and these maps is that within them, you get flows of capital. So financial, physical risk, all sorts of capital. And so you often get a transaction going on. So a user wants uh, a cup of tea, and there's a transaction going the other way, which is financial capital. So you can actually put metrics to this, and you actually start building business cases. So. What's wrong with this diagram? I've got a user, I'm, I'm, I'm ignoring the business. The business is, off, is a user as well, and of course one of their needs is profitability. Um, so we've taken that out, we're just looking at user, so we're looking at cost price here. A user wants a cup of tea, 35 cents. Um, uh, 20 cents is for the hot water, 15 cents into the kettle, including depreciation, five cents into the water, uh, five cents into power. Anybody see anything particularly wrong with that diagram other than the fact we're missing a mug? No? Well, there's flows in terms of physical flows in the other direction. Well, let, me, let me do it in a mapping form. Anybody see anything particularly, it's the same diagram, but mapping form. Anybody see anything particularly wrong with that diagram? Kettle, why have we got a custom-built kettle? Okay, uh, anybody heard of Thomas Thwaite? Uh, built a toaster from scratch. Uh, bought a 20-pound Argos toaster, broke it down into components, thought he'd build it from scratch with oil to make plastics, spent nine months, about a thousand pounds, built something which vaguely looked like a toaster, switched it on, it burst into flames, that was the end of it. Um, you often get people custom building stuff which is a commodity. Uh, and of course that has an impact. And of course when you say, use a standard kettle, they have inertia. Because like, oh, but our kettle's special. Um, and of course, if you reduce it, it reduces cost, you know, it has an impact, cost reduction. So insurance company. 
This is their process flow. They need compute, order server goods in, modify, mount, and rack it. And they had a bottleneck in terms of mounting and modifying servers into their data centers. So they decided to solve it by investing about two million in robotics. So you get robotics uh, to, to, to automate that and get rid, of, get rid of the bottleneck and improve the process flow. And they worked out, you know, it's basically got return investment under a year. Oh, fabulous. So you get them to map it. it takes about 10 minutes to map. Start off with the user, they need compute, they're arguing it's a product, okay, well, I disagree. You order a server, server comes into, uh, into goods in, uh, they've got rack mount to modify, and they've got two different flows there. Right, can you, anybody see anything wrong with this diagram? Hmm? Well, there are two pathways, one is it's coming in, one is the, the racking, so that bit's okay. Anybody, and see anything else? Have you look at where the rack is? What can you see? It's custom built. So I asked, why have you got rack in the custom built? And they said, because we have custom built racks. We have this company that makes them for them. So what, are you, what, what modifications are you making to the servers? Well, they don't fit into our racks. <laughs> so we have to take cases off them, drill new holes, and add new plates. And then that's why we need robotics. Anybody got an idea of a possible solution? Yes, of course, guess what happens? Inertia, but this is the way we've always done it. So you drive it over to more of a commodity, and, and now you're saying, well, what, what, what are we doing messing around with compute anyway? We're an insurance company. Uh, actually, we should just use a utility service, and we get rid of all these costs. You'll often find people optimizing flows um, for the most ineffective things. Um, they're trying to make it more efficient. And uh, uh, that, that's, that's one example. Now, I am sure I must have overrun by now. I will time out and say thank you very much. Thank you very much, Simon. Pleasure.